Chris, can you turn me down? See now, still too loud.
Can you hear me? Can you inch it up a little bit, Chris? There you go. Is that good? Whew. We're going to continue on page four in your worship leaflet. If you'll please kneel as you are able. Bless the Lord who forgives all our sins. Hear God's commandments regarding God and our neighbors. God calls us to love and obey God and to bring others to know God. God calls us to put nothing in the place of God. God calls us to show God respect in thought and word and deed. God calls us to set aside regular times for worship, prayer, and the study of God's ways. God calls us to love, honor, and help our parents and family, to honor those in authority, and to meet their just demands. God calls us to show respect for the life God has given us, to work and pray for peace, to bear no malice, prejudice, or hatred in our hearts, and to be kind to all the creatures of God. God calls us to use all our bodily desires as God intended. God calls us to be honest and fair in our dealings, to seek justice, freedom, and the necessities of life for all people, and to use our talents and possessions as people who must answer for them to God. God calls us to speak the truth and not to mislead others by our silence. God calls us to resist temptations to envy, greed, and jealousy, to rejoice in other people's gifts and graces, and to do our duty for the love of God, who has called us into fellowship with God. Since we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us with confidence draw near to the throne of grace, that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Let us confess our sins to God. God of all mercy, we confess that... Almighty God, have mercy on you, forgive you all your sins through the grace of Jesus Christ, strengthen you in all goodness, and by the power of the Holy Spirit, keep you in eternal life. be with you. Let us pray. Almighty God, you alone can bring into order the unruly wills and affections of sinners. Grant your people grace to love what you command and desire what you promise. That among the swift and varied changes of the world, our hearts may surely there be fixed where true joys are to be found. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God now and forever. 
Please be seated. A reading from the book. A reading from. A reading from the book of Ezekiel. <laughs> I did it. The hand of the Lord came upon me, and he brought me out by the Spirit of the Lord and set me down in the middle of a valley. It was full of bones. He led me all around them. There were very many lying in the valley, and they were very dry. He said to me, Mortal, can these bones live? I answered, O oh Lord God, you know. Then he said to me, Prophesy to these bones and say to them, O oh dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. Thus says the Lord God to these bones, I will cause breath to enter you, and you shall live. I will lay sinews on you and will cause the flesh to come upon you and cover you with skin and put breath in you and you shall live, and you shall know that I am the Lord. So I prophesied as I had been commanded, and as I prophesied, suddenly there was a noise, a rattling, and the bones came together, bone to bone. I looked, and there were sinews on them, and flesh had come upon them, and skin had covered them, but there was no breath in them. Then he said to me, prophesy to the breath, prophesy mortal, and say to the breath, thus says the Lord God, come from the four winds, O breath, and breathe upon these slain, that they may live. I prophesied as he commanded me, and the breath came into them, and they lived, and stood on their feet, a vast multitude. Then he said to me, mortal, these bones are the whole house of Israel. They say our bones are dried up and our hope is lost. We are cut off completely. Therefore prophesy and say to them, thus says the Lord God, I am going to open your graves and bring you up from your graves, O my people, and I will bring you back to the land of Israel. And you shall know that I am the Lord when I open your graves and bring you up from your graves, O my people, I will put my spirit within you and you shall live, and I will place you on your own soil. Then you shall know that I, the Lord, have spoken and will act, says the Lord. The word of the Lord. Let us recite Psalm 130 in unison. Out of the depths have I called to you, O Lord. Lord, hear my voice. Let your ears consider well the voice of my supplication. If you, Lord, were to know what is done in this, O Lord, who could stand? For there is forgiveness with you, therefore you shall be feared. I wait for the Lord, my soul waits for him. In his word is my hope. A reading from the letter of Paul to the Romans. To set the mind on the flesh is death, but to set the mind on the spirit is life and peace. For this reason, the mind that is set on the flesh is hostile to God. It does not sub submit to God's law. Indeed, it cannot. And those who are in the flesh cannot please God. But you are not in the flesh. You are in the spirit. 
since the Spirit of God dwells in you. Anyone who does not have the Spirit of Christ does not belong to him. But, but if Christ is in you, through the body, though the body is dead because of sin, the Spirit of life is because of righteousness. If the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the bed dwells in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will give life to your mortal bodies, also through his spirit that dwells in you. The word of the Lord. Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to John. Glory to you, Lord Christ. Now a certain man was ill, Lazarus of Bethany, the village of Mary and her sister Martha. Mary was the one who anointed the Lord with perfume and wiped his feet with her hair. Her brother Lazarus was ill. So the sisters sent a message to Jesus. Lord, he whom you love is ill. When Jesus heard it, he said, this illness does not lead to death, rather it is for God's glory, so that the Son of God may be glorified through it. Accordingly, though Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus, after having heard that Lazarus was ill, he stayed two days longer in the place where he was. Then after this he said to the disciples, let us go to Judea again. The disciples said to him, Rabbi, the Jews were just now trying to stone you and you are going to go there again? Jesus answered, are there not 12 hours of daylight? Those who walk during the day do not stumble because they see the light of this world. Those who walk at night stumble because the light is not in them. After saying this, he told them, our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep, but I am going to waken him. The disciples said to him, Lord, if he has fallen asleep, he will be all right. Jesus, however, had been speaking about his death, but they thought that he was referring merely to sleep. Then Jesus told them plainly, Lazarus is dead. For your sake, I am glad that I was not there, so that you may believe. But let us go to him. 
Thomas, who was called the twin, said to his fellow disciples, let us also go that we may die with him. When Jesus arrived, he found that Lazarus had already been in the tomb four days. Now Bethany was near Jerusalem, some two miles away, and many of the Jews had come to Mary and Martha to console them about their brother. When Martha heard that Jesus was coming, he went and met him, while Mary stayed at home. Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But even now I know that God will give you whatever you ask of him. Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. Martha said to him, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection on the last day. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. Those who believe in me, even though they die, will live, and everyone who lives and believes in me will never die. Do you believe this? She said to him, yes, Lord, I believe that you are the Messiah, the Son of God, the one coming into the world. When she had said this, she went back and called her sister Mary and told her privately, the teacher is here and is calling for you. And when she heard it, she got up quickly and went to him. Now Jesus had not yet come to the village, but was still at the place where Martha had met him. The Jews who were with her in the house, consoling her, saw Mary get up quickly and go out. They followed her because they thought that she was going to the tomb to weep there. When Mary came to where Jesus was and saw him, she knelt at his feet and said to him, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. When Jesus saw her weeping and the Jews who were who come with her also weeping, he was greatly disturbed in spirit and deeply moved. He said, where have you laid him? They said to him, Lord, come and see. Jesus began to weep. So the Jews said, see how he loved him. But some of them said, could not he who opened the eyes of the blind man have kept this man from dying? Then Jesus, again greatly disturbed, came to the tomb. It was a cave, and the stone was lying against it. Jesus said, take away the stone. Martha, the sister of the dead man, said to him, Lord, already there is a stench because he has been dead four days. Jesus said to her, did I not tell you that if you believed you would see the glory of God? So they took away the stone. And Jesus looked up and said, Father, I thank you for having heard me. I know that you always hear me, but I have said this for the sake of the crowd standing here, so that they may believe that you sent me. When he had said this, he cried with a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. The dead man came, his hands and feet bound with strips of cloth, and his face wrapped in a cloth. Jesus said to them, unbind him and let him go. Many of the Jews, therefore, who had come with Mary and seen, had seen what Jesus did, believed in him. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Christ. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of our, all our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our strength and our redeemer. Amen. The theme that is interwoven through all the readings we have this morning and the hymnody is one of hope. This is a hopeful Sunday. And this is found in two of my favorite passages, Ezekiel and the story of Lazarus, that really then, I think, reify this about our need to be hopeful. And Ezekiel acknowledges this and when he says, our bones are dried up, our hope is lost, we are cut off completely. And then Ezekiel is called in this vision to prophesy not just to the bones, but also to bring the breath, that is, the spirit, to these bones so that they may live. It is through God that this happens, that we have life, and it is synonymous then with hope. The image of the bones and flesh are also important because they are images of kinship. So when we see the bones coming to life, 
we have kinship, they have kinship with each other as they stand resurrected. They have kinship with God, who is the source of the breath, the spirit, and they have kinship then with the prophet. Everybody is interrelated in this story. And in the story of Ezekiel, the prophet stands in for us. We are called too to go and prophesy to bring hope and life through God's power where no hope can be found. This to mind calls to mind for me the spirit passage of Isaiah, Isaiah 61. The spirit or the ruach, the breath of the Lord God is upon me. God sends me to bring good news to the oppressed, bind up the brokenhearted, proclaim liberty to the captives, and release to the prisoners. That same spirit that Isaiah talks about and Ezekiel talks about comes upon us too, and we are renewed. We create a virtuous cycle. Spirit begets spirit, hope begets hope, as we then live our lives in Jesus. If I'm sorry, if Ezekiel is a stand-in for us in the first story, in John's story of Lazarus, who are we? Where do we stand? We are not Jesus, that's very clear. Are we a bystander to the action, like the disciples? Well, the artist and poet Jan Richardson asks us to identify with Lazarus. And she's written a poem about this, which I actually put in the bulletin so you can follow along with me. It's not long. Page 27. This poem brings me chills, which is why I wanted to share it with you. The Lazarus Blessing. The secret of this blessing is, that it is written on the back of what binds you. To read this blessing, you must take hold of the end of what confines you you must begin to tug at the edge of what wraps you round. It may take long and long for its length to fall away, for the words of this blessing to unwind in folds about your feet. But then you will no longer need them. By then this blessing will have pressed itself into your waking flesh, will have passed into your bones, will have traveled every vein until it comes to, re to rest in the chambers of your heart that beats to the rhythm of benediction and the cadence of release. The secret of this blessing, it is written on the back of what binds you. What binds you? What binds you? I do not want to valorize death and suffering. There is no good in suffering for suffering's sake. I don't want that. And yet we must discern then uh, between necessary and unnecessary suffering. I'll have more to say about that next week on Palm Sunday. Jung says people who uh, never helped their suffering by what they think for themselves, they are only then helped by the revelation of a wisdom greater than their own. It is that which lifts them out of their distress. A revelation of a wisdom greater than their own. The blessing that we find on the claw, the outside, the backside of the claws that bind us in our suffering. I love the imagery in the Lazarus blessing. We discover then wisdom when we are released from suffering and death. We find the wisdom in and through the suffering, as I said, the interior of those wrappings. And in that we find a place of hope and life. And the words of the Eucharistic prayer have been echoing through my mind this week. We say in that prayer towards the end, I say for all of you, we are a people of hope, justice, and love working to unbind ourselves and others from the necessary suffering of life. And we walk with people as they knowingly embrace their necessary suffering. 
And we find in that then, as we walk with them, it is a pathway to justice, wholeness, and healing. We walk with people as they work to unbind themselves from the things that inhibit or restrict them. And this week for me, on top of mind for this, are trans people and particularly trans children. If you've been following what's been going on in the Kentucky legislature for the last little while, they just passed uh, Senate Bill 150, which does several things. It ba bans gender-affirming care for youth. It requires doctors to detransition minors from gender-affirming care. There can be no talk of sexual orientation or gender identity in K through 12 classrooms in public schools, K through 12. It restricts the use of bathrooms to one's assigned uh, uh, one sex at birth, and teachers can refuse to use a student's preferred pronouns. It is draconian by any measure. And House Bill 470 is similar. Governor Bashir has vetoed these bills, but the legislature is poised to overturn the veto as it finishes its legislative session on March the 29th and 30th. We will talk more about the particulars of these bills and their impact when Rick Worth and I then will do a, a joint sermon together on the 23rd of April to talk about how it impacts kids and how do we think about this then theologically and in the context of the Episcopal Church. And I know some of you are thinking, do we really have to talk about this? But this got personal for me recently. My niece and her husband Andrew have five children. And she texted me and said, we have two new kids. Like, you have seven children now? And, she, and that was not it. So Madison, their eight-year-old, is now presenting as a boy. So he's now DJ. And Charlie, their seven-year-old, is now using um, non-binary non pronouns. And somebody I was talking to this about said, said, how do, you know, do the kids really know this early that they are what they are? And I said, well, in my experience, which is not the same, it's similar, is I knew I was gay by six or seven-ish. So I think our non-binary children our trans children, some of them know as well, in their seven, eight, five, that they are different. Do we have to talk about it? Yes. And I know it is confusing, especially the non-binary stuff. I was in a small group the other day here at Trinity saying Charlie is now using non-binary pronouns and we were kind of testing it out and see how it felt. It doesn't come off the tongue easily, at least for me. It's confusing. We have to talk about it. Even if we do not understand it fully, we have to talk about it. And we have to do more than talk about it. We have to act. This is grounded in Jesus and our baptismal covenant. We do two things in our baptismal covenant. We respect the dignity of every human being even our enemies, those who wish us harm, every human being. And we then are called to seek and serve Christ in all persons, not just those that we like or that we understand. As I said, the Eucharistic prayer calls us to be a people of hope, justice, and love. And in light of the two bills that are going through this, the legislature, that are going to be enacted into law, I know that peaceful protest is an option. We are people of hope, justice, and love, and we are to embody that, not just say it, but act it. So we're gathering, there's a group gathering in Frankfurt on Wednesday to protest these two bills. And I said, we follow the example of Jesus, we will hear next week, 
or throughout Holy Week, Jesus, after he comes into Jerusalem on Palm Sunday, goes to the temple. We hear the cleansing of the temple. But rather, it is not really the cleansing of the temple. It is then Jesus protesting the authority of the state. So we follow in the footsteps of Jesus. And we have to remember, I've been doing a lot of reading um, about the civil rights era. Martin Luther King Jr. was not popular during his lifetime because he did things that upset the apple cart. He was engaged in protests. It's not just the I have a dream speech. Much of his life was spent during his latter years crisscrossing the country to work for racial equity and justice. It's only after he's martyred that he becomes popular. Rosa Parks is reduced to one moment in that Montgomery bus, but she spent her life working then for racial justice. James Baldwin, the writer, the very famous African-American writer, in the 1960s gets vilified and his work then critiqued because he dared to then step, step into the space of re racial reconciliation and justice and not just stay a writer. So it's not popular to protest or to raise concerns. But I hope that we can follow. There's an example. There was a group of nuns in the Philippines during the um, regime of Ferdinand Marcos, who was a, a dictator and a tyrant. And some of the Filipino nuns went to protest. Their sisters who then wanted to support them cooked food for them. And the sisters who did not agree with them agreed then to pray for everyone in that protest, government and protesters alike. And I would suggest that we follow that model. Some of us will protest. Some will then support us. And so those people who disagree, I hope, will pray for everybody. Everybody here in the Commonwealth. This is one way that we can embody hope when the landscape seems full of dry bones. There is no help in sight if the legislature passes those bills. And yet we are still to embody hope. And we do that then, we prophesy to those dry bones of anti-trans legislation by protesting against injustice and cruelty so that these bones can live again. Amen. We're going to continue with the Nicene Creed on page 358. We believe in one God.
please join me in the prayers of the people found on page 387 in the Book of Common Prayer or page 11 in your service list. Father, we pray for your holy Catholic Church. That we all may be one. Grant that every member of the Church may truly and humbly serve you. That your name be glorified by all people. We pray for all bishops, priests, and deacons. That they may be faithful ministers of your word and sacraments. We pray for all who govern and hold authority in the nations of the world. That there may be justice and peace on the earth. Give us grace to do your will in all that we undertake. That our words be found in your sight. Have compassion on those who suffer from any grief or trouble. And they may be delivered from their distress. Give to the departed eternal rest. Let the light of perpetual shine upon them. We praise you for your saints who have entered into joy. And may we also come to share in your heavenly kingdom. Let us pray for our own needs and those of others. We pray for those celebrating birthdays this week, especially Jessica, John, Carter, John, William, Travis, Miles, and those we now name, either silently or aloud. Grant that they may grow in wisdom and grace and strengthen their trust in your goodness all the days of their lives. We pray for those who suffer, especially James, Shannon, Brett, Mary, Joan, Beth, Pam, Tina, Mary, Peru was de Esperanza, Matson, Marcia, the Raleigh family, Tim, Ariel, Joe, Karen, Charlie, Dean, Mary Ann, Sarah, Brian, Rodney, John, Grant, Doug, Valerie, Rebecca, David, Arlene, Derek, Dan, the people and leaders of both Ukraine and Russia, Annabelle, David, Azil, Lee, Nick, Matthew, Candy, Kevin, and those we now name, either silently or aloud. We pray for those who have died, especially Frank, Jean, and for those we now name, either silently or aloud. We give thanks for Trinity Church. Please join me in the Trinity Mission Prayer. O oh, gracious God, you have taught us that in giving we can accomplish miracles. You have given us the mission to serve one another with whatever gift each has received. Walk with us through the seasons of our lives. Inspire us through the Holy Spirit. Strengthen and nurture the Almighty God, you created us in your own image. Grant us grace fearlessly to contend against evil 
and to make no peace with oppression. And that we may reverently use our freedom, help us to employ it in the maintenance of justice in our communities and among the nations. To the glory of your holy name, through Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. My friends, may the peace of Christ be always with you. Please be seated. It's all you, Elise. All right. Good morning. Good morning. My name is Elise Heider. I love that Trinity welcomes everyone. We are so glad you're here. Welcome all. Welcome online. Uh, uh, we're so glad you're here with us this morning. I'd love to meet you after the service in this green tiled area. I have a, a nice little souvenir for you. Um, and we ask that you fill out this uh, blue card so we can learn more about you and connect and um, look forward to meeting you after church. Thank you. Thanks, Elise. I'd also like to welcome everybody who's online with us today. Uh, we're delighted you're with us. I'd love to be able to send you a mug and some information about Trinity if you'll Either put it in the live, your postal address in the live chat from Brandon Long, our digital evangelist, or you can send me your postal address at rector at trinitycovington.org, and I will send you that. Our Trinity Enlightened discussion this morning will be Meg Kale, who's going to be discussing her work as our community event specialist, as she is now known, and the challenges she has encountered since beginning the position, as well as what she is planning in 2023. The, la the f fifth session of our book discussion group, The Difficult Words of Jesus, will meet in the upstairs classroom. Everybody is welcome to that, even if you have not read the book. It's uh, been fascinating. And uh, Susan Blom can, is the point of contact for that if you want more information. <coughs> Rooted will take place, our half an hour service of meditation and reflection on the scriptures will take place at 4 p.m. this afternoon. Rooted 2. Our second offering of that occurs at 6.45 on Wednesday. Same service, different times. For more information, see me. Uh, on page 23 of your service bulletin, you'll find the user's guide to Holy Week, all that's going on next week in Holy Week, um, and all the exciting things that we're going to be doing there. Um, if you are interested in going to Frankfurt on Wednesday, we're going to have a brief meeting here in the sanctuary directly following church, so just stay put. We'll spend 10 minutes working out the logistics for it, and then we can be on our way to coffee hour and to TAD and to Resonant. So stick around here. There are more announcements on page 22 in your service leaflet. I know Brandon Long has an announcement. Two quick announcements for family ministry to this week. Uh, number one, in the email uh, this week at Trinity, you should have received notification about our confirmation class. I've also sent out an invitation to all parents. Uh, this is youth uh, confirmation. This is youth confirmation. So all parents who have students in 7th to 12th grade, we are preparing our confirmation this year. Uh, classes will be taking place every Sunday, April 16th through May 14th. Uh, we will be going through the book, My Faith, My Life, um, and I want to encourage parents of those students and the students themselves. Um, confirmation isn't necessarily something that will be pressured upon you. It is an opportunity for you and your student to explore the faith, to make the faith themselves. Uh, just because they enter the class doesn't mean that they have to be confirmed at the end of it. Really, it's a journey of exploration. And so I encourage you, for, if you have a 7th to 12th grader, please register them online. Um, and then the second thing to know is all middle and high school students 
we will be having an after church class uh, for now on, from this point on, um, this so today, Sunday. Today? Today, yes, in the multi-purpose room. Thank okay, you. Good. Um, adult confirmation or reception, if you're interested in that, exploring that, we will also be meeting beginning on April the 16th, um, the 16th, the 23rd, the 30th, and May 7th. Um, we have a book available, a very brief book available. Again, if you enter the class, you do not then need to be confirmed or received. So if you, don't, if you can explore it, you can decide you want to do it later, you don't want to do it at all, but we'd love to have you be part of this class because it's, it's been just, we've done it before and it's been delightful. So you can see Susan for books. Okay. That was a second sermon. So long, so much going on. If you are offering your gift at the altar and there remember that your sister or brother has something against you, leave your gift there before the altar and go. First be reconciled to your sister or brother and then come and offer your gift.
continue on page 14 in your worship leaflet. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. This is Thanks and praise are yours at all times and in all places, our true and loving God. Through Jesus Christ, your eternal word, the wisdom from on high, by whom you created all things. You laid the foundations of the world and enclosed the sea when it burst out of the womb. You brought forth all creatures of the earth and gave breath to humankind. Wondrous are you, Holy One of blessing. All you create is a sign of hope for our journey. And so as the morning stars sing your praises, we join the heavenly beings and all creation as we shout with joy. creator of all. Your word has never been silent. You called a people to yourself as a light to the nations. You delivered them from bondage and led them to a land of promise. Of your grace, you gave Jesus to be human, to share our life, to proclaim the coming of your holy reign, and to give himself for us a fragrant offering. Through Jesus Christ, our Redeemer, you have freed us from sin, brought us into your life, reconciled us to you, and restored us to the glory you intend for us. We thank you that on the night before he died for us, Jesus took bread, and when he had given thanks to you, he broke it, and gave it to his friends and said, take, eat. This is my body broken for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. After supper, Jesus took the cup of wine, said the blessing, gave it to his friends, and said, drink this, all of you, this cup is the new covenant in my blood, poured out for you and for all for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. And so remembering that all that was done for us, the cross, the tomb, the resurrection and ascension, longing for Christ's coming in glory, and presenting to you these gifts your earth has formed and human hands have made, we acclaim you, O Christ. Dying, you destroyed our death. Rising, you restored our life. Christ Jesus, come in glory. Send your Holy Spirit upon us and upon these gifts and bread of wine, that they may be to us the body and blood of your Christ. Grant that we, burning with your Spirit's power, may be a people of hope, justice, and love. Giver of life, draw us together in the body of Christ, and in the fullness of time, gather us with the ever-blessed Virgin Mary and all your people into the joy of our true eternal home. Through Christ and with Christ and in Christ, by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, we worship you, our God and Creator, in voices of unending praise.
Let us pray together the prayer of Jesus. Ground of all being, Mother, Mother of life, Father of the universe, your name is sacred beyond speaking. May we know your presence. May your longings be our longings in heart and in action. May there be food for the human family today and for the whole Earth community. Forgive us the falseness of what we have done as we forgive those who are untrue to us. Do not forsake us in our time of conflict. The gifts of God for the people of God, take them in remembrance that Christ died for you and feed on him in your hearts by faith with thanksgiving.
If you'll please rise as you're able, we'll continue on page 18 with the sending forth of the Eucharistic Visitor. In the name of God and this congregation, I send you each forth bearing these holy gifts, that those to whom you go share with us in the communion of Christ's body and blood. We who are many are one body, because we all share one bread, one cup. Can I please ask the congregation to kneel as you are able? Let us pray. Eternal God, Heavenly Father, you have graciously accepted us as living members of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ, and you have fed us with spiritual food in the sacrament of his body and blood. Send us now into the world in peace and grant us strength and courage to love and serve you with gladness and singleness of heart through Christ our Lord. Amen. Look with compassion, O Lord, upon this your people, that rightly observing this holy season, they may learn to know you more fully and to serve you with a more perfect will through Christ our Lord. Amen. Let's sing hymn number 455, please. Amen. 